Hey folks, thanks for joining us here at Fig Tree Ministries for the second part of our lesson on parables. So we're going to look today at the parable of the mustard seed. Now, if you haven't seen part one to this series, I would suggest going back and watching part one as that lays a foundation that we're going to be working off of for analyzing parables. Now, the key to this parable today of the mustard seed and basically every other parable, is that we have to learn about the cultural and scriptural, meaning the Old Testament, context that Jesus is drawing upon to express his message. It's something that his audience would be aware of that for us in our modern Western culture are often lacking the same picture or knowledge that they would have. So join us today on this journey as we break down this parable to unlock the messages that still apply to us today. So we are continuing on with parable to give another example so that we can get to next week because next week's parable is a little bit, um, there's a lot of moving parts. Now, I realized as I was about to correct my slide this week from home word to homework, I thought, no, 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 this is actually correct. I want you to read the word of God at home, and it shouldn't be work. So we're going to continue to call it do your home word. And your home word is this. So this is the parable we're going to talk about next week. And it will help you to be familiar at least somewhat with some of the, what he's pulling into it. All the, the metaphors that Jesus is going to pull in. This is, the, this is the single hardest thing for a modern Westerner to read a parable is that we don't understand his metaphor. We don't get where he's pulling it from the text. We don't understand the cultural context. We don't understand what their thinking was. So... It's, it gets confusing if you don't have at least some level of familiarity with the different uh, metaphors he's going to use. One of which is Isaiah 5. So Isaiah 5. Now, if you don't go there now, but if you, when you read that, you'll immediately see Jesus is using this part of Isaiah 5. Now, I got to tell you something. This is a little to clue you in, he's going to change the story. So it's a little detail that he changes, but it's a significant detail because when he's talking at the priest, they catch his change. So you can read Isaiah 5 to say, what, what did they understand about Isaiah 5? But then we have to notice that Jesus is going to twist something. He loves to do that to cause you to think. And then Psalm 118, you're all familiar with the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. That's Psalm 118. He's going to pull that one in. And you gotta get, now you scratch your head and you say, what, why is he pulling this story in? What is it saying about what's going to happen? I'll show you another cultural piece that is pretty funny when you set it next to what Jesus says. So, Okay, so that's your home word. Now we're going to continue on with the idea of parable. So this is a review from last week. So some characteristics. The moment Jesus said, let me tell you a parable, you got to remember that all these things are going on. So first of all, it's always in story form. Story, again, we, every human being loves stories. Kids love stories. Adults love stories. The story allows you to carry the message with you. That's the key. This part, as we'll see today, often throws us modern Westerners because we sometimes read the parable as a literal telling of a historical event or that every detail in the parable is somehow, in fact, a true detail when it's not. They're fiction. A tortoise and a hare got in a race. Clearly, fiction. Yet, what, what lies right above the parable? Truth. So you use the story to tell a, a, a more prominent truth. But again, we, this sometimes throws us, and I think I'll, sh I'll show you one today. It 
throws us a little bit. Okay, it carries the truth. There you go. So the story, even though fictional, nothing wrong with that, carries the truth. And then the final one is, and we'll see this today, Jesus loves to add a twist, something that's going to shock his audience, something that's going to get their mind thinking. If you go to church and hear the same message every single time, your brain eventually shuts off. And so if someone shows up and throws a twist in everything, your brain goes, wait, wait a minute. What's going on here? Is this, am I throwing a twist in things? But Jesus loves to add a, a little shocking twist to it. Now, it's a story. We mentioned that. So it allows you to carry the teaching with you. And there's even a parable about parables. And it says, a teaching without a parable is like a basket without handles. How do you pick the basket up to take it with you? You need parables. You need handles on the commandment. And so what we do is we take a commandment and you weave it into a parable so that now you can take that with you your whole life and say, I understand. Now, I added one to this. So this is going to be important today. Fiction. Nothing wrong with Jesus telling a fictional story as long as the truth is true, right? We want him to tell us the truth, but he does it in a way that's not necessarily a true story. So the details matter. So every detail we see that Jesus is adding in or not adding in, as we'll see next week, causes your mind to go, wait a minute, something's missing from the story. If you tell your grandchildren the same story a hundred times, and then you change a detail, they'll all go, whoa, 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 whoa. You change that. Something switched. So it gets their attention when you change a detail. Uh, again, Jesus has full charge of the details. So Aesop, as telling parables, has full charge of all the details in the par or I'm sorry, the fables. He's got full charge. So if he puts a detail in the fable, he's intending it to be there. So when Jesus adds a detail, he wants you to see the details. Now, this is the one that I added this week. They're often told in, with, using metaphor, right? The kingdom of God is like, and now we have a metaphor over here. But what Jesus does, he'll, I, I think he's doing it this week as we look at the, the mustard seed, and he's definitely going to do it next week as he's pulling metaphors in, but he's twisting them together and he's mixing them up. And that makes it, oh man, that makes it so much harder for us because not only do I have a hard time understanding the, the metaphor, now he's mixed it. Well, thanks, Jesus, this isn't helping me. But to, their, for, to his audience, he knew their audience would catch the mixing. So he's mixing a metaphor, and you'll see with the mustard seed, if we think it's one big metaphor, we look for a particular tree. Well, what if he's mixing it? What if he adds in a different metaphor, and that means he's talking about a different tree? So we'll, I'll show you that. All right, and so this one's on your sheet too. In almost all parables, not only Jesus has about 40 parables in the New Testament, but the 1,500 other parables that exist, they all are trying to help you understand certain difficult topics. And in, of course, religious setting, these topics are usually something like the kingdom of God. How do we understand the kingdom of God? Well, we need a story to help us understand it. What's God's relationship to humanity? What's human to human relationship? So the parable of the Good Samaritan is human to human relationship. The guy says, who's my neighbor? Jesus goes, ah, I have a parable to tell you. To solidify who you have to love. It's human to human relationships. And then the second one, or the last one, I'm sorry, is commandment. If there's a difficult commandment that they're trying to understand from God, you can use a parable. And so then you take something difficult and you tell a story with things that are all known to you. There was a king. He went away. He came back. And now everybody's thinking about, okay, yeah, I get it. There's a king. There's a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one. They all understand shepherding. There's a father who has two sons. There's a farmer who went out to sow his seed. 
everybody in that culture it understands farming. So you get, ah, I know exactly what he's talking about. So those are just some of the very, uh, these are the very common ones that you'll see all the time, if, if, even if you look beyond the New Testament into parables uh, from other sources. Okay, so now let's turn. This is the parable we're going to do today. Notice it's right next to the parable we did last week, so this is going to actually make some sense in a little bit. So turn to Matthew 13, 31 to 32. Now, there is a ever-raging debate on the Internet over this parable. So just Google parable of the mustard seed and watch how many opinions there are. Everybody's trying to figure it out. This one's a bit consuming, I think. There are some parables no one pays attention to. This one, it's like everybody's paying attention to it. So he immediately starts out, right? He told them another parable. So in your mind, the, as soon as you hear, I'm telling you a parable, now you go into parable mode. Okay, it's a story. It's fictional. There's, he's going to weave a whole bunch of stuff in. Now maybe you don't know he's going to twist it and shock you, but inevitably. So he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like. So there's, the, there's our unknown. We're trying to understand how does this kingdom of heaven business work? It's like a mustard seed. So right there, he's giving you something from their culture. And this is my opinion. I would be willing to bet that if this were, a, if this were the mustard seed he was talking about, he would do something like this. He'd lead the crowd over. He'd stand with it right behind him. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And they're, they're all looking at it going, wait a minute, because he's going to teach what's right in front of you. And he wants you to experience it not just as a, you know, we, we take our kids, we put them in a classroom, and we want to talk about life, but never go experience the life. So in my opinion, he's probably stopped right next to a mustard plant that he's talking about and starts to tell the parable. And now they're staring at the, you know, the mustard plant and him, and they're listening, and they're going, okay. And it becomes, there's an added punch to it. Okay, so we have to figure out that one. Why does he use that metaphor? Plants are always very specifically used for the characteristic of the plant. You could tell a story about a rose bush, or you could tell a story about an oak tree, and they're totally different stories because of the characteristics of the plant. All right, a man took and planted in his field. Now, you'll see in a little bit, this is a joke. This is his twist. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, when it grows... It's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. Now, this is where I think we get our, we're looking for, everybody's out searching for what's the smallest seed that also grows into a tree. And then if we look at a mustard seed that we make the condiment out of, well, it's not the smallest seed. And so we go, uh oh, what's happening? We've got a, there's something going on. There's something in the twist that's happening here. And then, there's something about a metaphor of a tree, and we'll look at that too. So that the birds come and perch in its branches. That is a key phrase. Okay, so there's the teeny little parable. Now let's go break it down a little bit. So if we do our little diagram, your unknown and difficult, no doubt, is the kingdom of God. And you say, okay, well, what's known? Well, I got a mustard seed, got to figure that one out. I've got a, a man's planting it in his garden. You've got a smallest of seeds. So is that a detail I need to know? If he, if he put the detail in there. And then something about birds in the branches, or if we read the same story in Mark, he says the birds enjoy the shade. That's a key word too. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go down these. So let's talk about mustard seed. And here is where the debate is raging. So, the common mustard plant that you use to eat and make mustard out of by grinding the seeds is this one. It's black mustard. At least in Israel, this was the one that they used the most. And you notice, when you look at this picture, very distinctly, 
how large the seeds are. It's a big seed pod, and you can see how the seeds are carried inside that seed pod. So there's all the seeds. Let me show you just a little. I, I zoomed in just a little bit, but this is going to be key to our understanding because if he includes a detail about the smallest of seeds and we go to this plant, we realize those aren't the smallest of seeds. So then we'd go, well, wait a minute. Is it possible there's another mustard plant? And the answer would be yes, of course. So mustard as a species has a bunch of sub. I, I'm not a plant person, so if I didn't get species to subspecies correct, somebody correct me about the way that you categorize a plant. But there's another mustard plant. It also grows in Israel. It looks like this, Brassica elongata. And one thing we notice are these elongated flowers, and eventually you'll have a seed pod in those. Now, what's the difference between this plant and the other mustard plant? Okay, we'll, we'll see the sides of the seeds in a minute. Well, I'll show you a picture of one that's growing. The biggest difference between this one and why I would say, why would you plant this in your garden, is that it's considered a noxious weed. This is the weed, right. So if he's standing next to this one and says, it's like a man who planted a mustard seed in his garden, everybody scratches their head and says, what an idiot. You just planted a, it's also an invasive species. It's even here in America. You can't stop the spread. And this grows all over Israel but the farmers hate it because it will take over your garden. There's a picture of it. Now, exactly, these grow here in San Diego. You'll see, them, you'll see them growing as a weed along the, sometimes as I'm getting off the highway, I look over and there's one of these plants growing. So they're in, they've gotten to the United States, just like the kingdom of God. You can't stop the spreading. Yes. Okay, so you notice here's the elongated flowers on them. Uh, now, this one, we happen to be standing at Bet Shan. So many of you have been to Bet Shan before. Here's a picture of Bet Shan. This is a, one of the Decapolis cities. Decapolis meaning it's a Greek city. The Decapolis, the ten cities. And this one is actually the only one that's on the western side of the Jordan River. And when you go there today, now, when I went there, the guy who took us, he knows the way he wants to take you. He takes you from the back, so you can't see all these ruins yet. And you're just walking over this hilltop, and when suddenly you crest the hilltop and you see this massive city, huge columns, giant feeder in the background. This is the Agora, where you did all your shopping. There's public toilets. There's public baths over here. I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a typical Greek city where it's all about you, right? I deserve a break today. I did it my way. I'm number one. And it's there to serve you. Synagogue in the middle? No way. Not here. Okay. So we happen to be standing inside this theater and the teacher looks up and says hey someone climb up there and grab that plant because it's just a weed growing out of the rock right so that's the plant right here so he says okay let me show you the seed now wait let me help you here because the seed is that this is a seed pod it carries Hundreds of little seeds. All these little specks on her hand are the seed. Now, is that the smallest seed of the garden? Yeah. And that little seed pod, once it releases and breaks, the seeds go everywhere and will immediately start to grow. So you can see how this can become an invasive species because it just, it can so quickly release all of its seeds 
in a, in, and get moving. Yeah, and it's the smallest of the seeds. So here's the twist, right? Because why would a guy plant that, a noxious weed, an invasive species, in his garden? That's what gets your attention. Because you could grow normal mustard plant. They cultivated the normal plant for the seeds, for the leaves. Yes. Well, remember, it's, so he's telling, us, he's telling a fictional story, and he wants you to think, right? But what happens the moment you plant this in your garden? Takes over. That's the kingdom of God. The smallest little planting of the kingdom of God, you have no idea how that thing can spread and take over. So does the world like it when we walk down and say, you guys mind if we plant just a little teeny seed of the kingdom of God here? And they all say, no way, get out of here, we hate that, that's just noxious weed, that's, you know. And the, the world starts to react like a weed is growing in their midst. So it's a great way to, to say, okay, let me, let's keep going for a minute. All right, so that little seed grows up into a much bigger plant. Now this isn't the biggest of them, but there's one. It's the same type of of it's just growing in the middle of a lot and in, in Israel and that's grown pretty tall, right? So that thing you could you could say, well is that the great tree we're talking about where the birds are going to sit? Well, who knows. The point is that little teeny seed can spread easily, can take over and can grow up uncontrollably. So he really wants us to think about what the kingdom of God is. But he doesn't want you to think mustard plant that's like, I think I have a picture, this. Like this is more cultivated mustard. This is near the Sea of Galilee, and it's, a cult of, it's more cultivated mustard. It's not growing as wild. And just we have the same issues here in America. You have cultivated plants and you have non-cultivated plants. All right, so as we've kind of, oh, let me, here's this. Plenty of the Elder, first century a uh, scientist, in a way, wrote some books about science and the natural world, and he says this about mustard plants, or the mustard seed, but on one hand, when it has once been sown, so once you sow it, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it. You can't get it back out. So again, a man planted a mustard seed in his garden, and everyone scratches their head and says, Wait, what? Why would he do that? And the seed, when it falls, germinates at once. He's living during the time Jesus is. That's why scholars would think he's probably standing next to the one he wants you to think about. As he's walking along a path, there's a weed, and he stops and says, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he starts to talk about it, because now you're looking at the one that he wants you to think about. Okay, so we could kind of say this. If we take the mustard plant, or the mustard seed, that's a weed, we would say that the kingdom of heaven is, in a weird way, an invasive species, meaning it's going to invade wherever it's at. It's the smallest of seeds. Yes, it doesn't take much of the kingdom of God to begin to spread. Once it's there, you can't stop the spreading. You can't just eject it back out. It spreads unstoppable, and it will take over your garden. So that is bringing more of, ah, okay, Here's, this is why the twist is so important. The sages in the first century, when they thought about the kingdom of God, they thought about it as being static. And when Jesus shows up, every single thing he tells you is, it's active, it's moving, you can't stop it. It's breaking forth. The kingdom of God is breaking forth violently. The kingdom of God is like a, is yeast that you put in dough. And what happens once you put that yeast in? You can't stop it. It's moving. The last word, the very last word in the book of Acts, 
is the is the Greek word unstoppable. Now it doesn't show up that way in your in your English sentence. But Paul's teaching about the the kingdom of God and it's unstoppable. So the very last word of of Acts is this punch that you can't stop this advancement. All right, so let's look at a modern comparison. We've done this before, but it's always fun. So that little seed could grow into something that looks like that. For those of you who've gone to the South, kudzu. So kudzu in the South was brought, it was brought to America during the World Fair in Philadelphia. Thank you very much, whoever brought it into America. So you bring in an invasive weed, and nobody can stop the movement of kudzu. And so if Jesus were giving this sermon in Georgia, he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who took kudzu and planted it in his garden. And the whole audience says, what kind of knucklehead plants kudzu in his garden? Because you know then, it's an unstoppable movement. What did you say last time? You're, if you stand still long enough, kudzu will grow over you. So this is why they think when he's, when he's talking about the smallest of the seeds that's breaking forth unstoppable, he's not talking about the black mustard. He's talking about the other mustard plant. And that starts to make more sense. And when you look at the whole message of the rest of, the, of our New Testament is the advancement of the gospel that you cannot stop once it gets going. Okay, now, we have to deal with something else, though, because we have this other thing, and the man planted, that's a difficult one. Who's the man? Well, first of all, he's a knucklehead who planted kudzu in his garden. Why would you do that? But that gets your audience thinking, right? The other one is, I'm going to show you in a minute, that somehow I think he's relating the man planting something to God, and I'll show you why. So we have the man planted and then you have this idea of the birds and the branches. So what we tend to do is we look for a mustard plant that's tall enough to have the birds live in its shade. Well, the cultivated mustard plant can't do that. It's pretty low. The weed, you think, okay, that's a tree, but is it big enough for the birds? And I think right here is that Jesus is switching his metaphor. And then we all say, well, which metaphor did he switch to? Because I don't understand what this says. Okay, that's where we need to go next. In the ancient world, they're always thinking about the cosmos, their universe, their whole world, and they think about it in metaphorical terms to something that they know. Like, the mountains are a gateway to get to the heavens. Now, we know, well, no, that's not really true, although technically we know God is up there, so that would kind of make sense to us a little bit. And we love tall buildings. One of the metaphors for the cosmos is a cosmic tree. That the cosmos is like a tree. Because they, obviously, in the ancient world, you notice trees. And you notice some trees are really tall. And it looks like the tree is climbing to the sky or into the heavens. Then the cosmic tree is at the center of the the cosmos, the universe, and all of life spreads out from that. Now, in our Bible, what's at the center of the garden of God? It's a tree. Now, it's a different tree. So, a co yes, it's the tree of life. A cosmic tree is different than the tree of life. The tree of life revives you. It gives you life. It gives you eternal life. So the moment that Adam and Eve ate from the, tr the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and suddenly they became aware, God said, uh-oh, we can't let them eat from the tree of life. And he pushes them out of the garden. So our job is to get back into the garden and eat from the tree of life. So it's a little bit, it's a different metaphor, but I want you to notice something. In all stories about the cosmic tree, what's guarding this tree? A snake. You always have a snake. Now, to the ancient mind, that makes sense, because where do snakes live? In trees. So you see them in trees. 
at the bottom here, every root has a snake coiled around it. So you have some kind of snake that's guarding a tree. And in this case, it's what they call the cosmic tree. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because this idea of the cosmic tree shows up in the biblical text. Not the tree of life. That's a little bit different. But this does show up. I wanted to show you this picture, too, because it's Scandinavian. This is a Scandinavian view of the tree of life, or the, the cosmic tree. And you could imagine that, because if you live in Scandinavia, there's wood everywhere. In Israel, the trees aren't, you get the, you get the cedars of Lebanon, but you don't get as much wood. So what do you use? I use a mountain, a rock. Anyways, okay, so this cosmic tree. In the Bible, the cosmic tree the way, when they start describing it, it's always used to describe a kingdom. Now, what is the parable talking about? The kingdom of God. And so we have three examples in the text of this cosmic tree talking about a kingdom. Now, we're not going to read them today, but do that as part of your homework. Because when you read them, you'll say, oh, I see the language is being repeated. The first one is Daniel 4. Again, don't turn there. But Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he says, I looked out unto the plain, and there was a tree that was growing to the heavens. And as he goes on to describe it, you see he's, what he's describing is this cosmic tree that all of the cosmos are encapsulated in. He tells Daniel the story because what freaked him out is the tree gets cut down. And Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you right? There's a fun job. Tell the king that you're the tree that's going to get cut down. It's a representation of his kingdom. The second one is Ezekiel 31, and that's talking about the kingdom of Assyria. It was this tree. It had branches. It provided shade. There's, it'll, he goes through a whole metaphor of that. The last one, let's go there, Ezekiel 17, God's going to plant a tree. And let's look at the, the language that Ezekiel uses. So turn, if you would, to Ezekiel 17. And, you know, I know the Old Testament is so big. There's so many details to it. And Jesus, of course, is using it as a giant well. It always makes me sad when I totally miss a metaphor that is somewhere in the Old Testament because it's just so vast. It's so hard for us to grab a hold of all the details. But everybody in Jesus' audience knows their Old Testament. That's their Bible. So it's really hard for us to sometimes realize that these metaphors are coming right out of the text, the, the Scripture. So what I want you to notice is just look at Ex or, uh, Ezekiel 17. Look at verse 1 and 2. And let's notice how this thing starts out. The word of the Lord came to me, now verse 2, Son of man. Set forth a what? An allegory, which is a story. It's not a true story, but it, all of the symbols represent something that's going to tell you truth. So set forth an allegory and tell it to the Israelites as a parable. Now, wouldn't it be cool if Jesus tells a parable and then pulls from a parable in the Old Testament? Because they all know the parable of what's about to be said. Now go down to verse 22, I believe. Yes. And this is where we're going to see God is going to plant a tree in Israel. And the tree is this cosmic tree where the whole cosmos is now going to be, in their metaphor, living amongst, amongst the tree. So he says this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself... God is going to take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from the topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. Okay? Where's the high and lofty mountain? On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. Let's look at the very next line. Oh, wait, sorry. There's one line in between the very next line. I will, it will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Now, let's look at this line. Birds of every kind will nest in it. 
they will find shelter in the shade of its branches. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yes. Possibly. I don't know that much about cedars. I don't. Th- it's not a fruit-bearing tree, but I think it's the metaphor of the cosmic tree. Yeah, that you, you can have the fruit. If you read Daniel 4 and you read Ezekiel 31, you'll see that the tree, this cosmic tree, provides shade and shelter for all the animals and the birds. And that's the key sentence, is they picture this as providing shelter for the people. And here, all the birds find its shelter in the shade. And you go, oh, okay, I think, I think Jesus is digging on another metaphor here. Right, it goes from being something that could be negative, an invasive species, but then it, the, it says it grows into the largest of g- garden plants and then a tree. And so you think, well, what tree is it growing into? Well, when we spread through the littlest bit of a mustard seed, the kingdom of God, it grows into what they pictured as this cosmic tree, the thing that will provide shelter for the whole world. Now, that's in just using Eastern metaphor. Well, the tree is the kingdom, because every time the Bible uses this metaphor of the cosmic tree, it's talking about a kingdom. So the kingdom of God is like a tree that provides shelter and shade for all the people of the world. What's that? So it is comfortable. God is your shade at your right hand. Okay. So I think he's got two metaphors going. He's got the mustard plant first, which means it's this un, it's nonstop spreading like an invasive weed. But oh, by the way, that invasive weed, which you think, you know, can't grow too much, is going to turn into this cosmic tree that the whole, that comforts the entire cosmos. Well, see, that's, that's the question is, who's this man? Is it just the farmer that was stupid and planted that seed in his farm? Or is it just like God who planted his kingdom and it's going to grow? And I think you could kind of hold that in a, in a tension to say, boy, I don't know, but boy, that, that starts to make sense in light of Ezekiel. Yeah, God, this is certainly a parable of transformation. It's not what you would expect. The smallest of seed grows into this great cosmic tree. Yes. Well, here's the other thing. It's very important to remember. Jesus says this sentence. God makes it rain on the just and the unjust. Who also gets shade from the cosmic tree? The unjust. And we want to say, no, no, our shade, our shade. You don't get any of that. Jesus says, no, 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 no. God makes it rain on the just and the unjust. And there will be a day, you don't need to worry about when that day is, that God will judge everybody. It's not your job to judge them. Simply build the kingdom. And yes, will they enjoy the shade? Of course. But it's not your responsibility to judge them. Leave that to God. All right, so the kingdom of heaven is like a little seed, right? It's unstoppable. Just like the, le- the yeast la- last week. It's unstoppable. And it grows, that little unstoppable seed that everyone thinks is a weed can grow into something of the cosmic tree, the tree that shelters the whole world in Eastern metaphor. So the kingdom of heaven is like... A mustard seed, which a man planted, (laughs) ha, 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 joke, in his field. Though it's the smallest of seeds, when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants. And notice that it goes from being a garden plant and becomes a tree. Now, that was the, what do we have to figure out? Well, which tree? The cosmic tree. How do we know? Look at the next sentence. So the birds come and perch in its branches. Or if you read Mark, he adds the word in the shade. And that's right out of the Ezekiel, the Daniel picture of the cosmic tree. Go back and read them. It's once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's what's so cool. Once you realize what they're talking about, 
you go, ah, oh, that's so cool how they're, all the animals live in the tree and the, the birds of the air. And Now, we've done that before, so hopefully that was a good review to remind you, plant a mustard seed. Thanks for watching our lesson today on the parable of the mustard seed. If you'd like to help us spread some mustard seeds for the kingdom of God, click that share button below and choose your favorite social media platform like Facebook to send it out to all your friends. Let's plant some mustard seeds out there and watch the kingdom of God expand. May God richly bless you in all your biblical studies.